Every one of the 52 stories that we are exploring this year is embedded in a larger story, an overarching narrative that the Bible tells. First, this is the first move in the story. We are estranged from God. Born to live in paradise, we are instead exiled, exiles living east of Eden, neither where we should be nor who we should be. We are born to live so close to God that he might walk out from behind the hedgerows and surprise us in the evening gloaming. But instead, we are estranged. To be human, the story says, is for that separation, that essential, existential, foundational separation to surface in our interactions with each other. Divided from the love that made us, we then turn and struggle with one another. I feel the truth of this story. I see it happening. It is why we try to solve the problem of violence with more violence. It is why we struggle to be understood. It is why we don't even understand ourselves. It is why God feels so obvious, but also so far away. It is why doing the right thing is so logical, but also so often impossible. But God has not said the end. Indeed, we are barely past once upon a time. And the heart of the story is this. The good news of our religion is that God cannot and will not tolerate this great divide. God cannot and will not tolerate this great divide between herself and us, between me and you, between you and whoever it is that has wounded you, between the person you were born to be and the person that you are, between all of us in this great earth. And so the heart of the story says that after the fall, the next move is for God himself to give away all majesty, to give away control, to surrender omnipotence, to leap right into the chasm that separates us from the love that made us, to pull each and every one of us back into embrace with the love that made us. In God, in Jesus, God bridges the gap, brings us back into Eden, forgives the Adam and Eve that live inside each one of us and erases every petty little sin we have committed in the process. All of this, I think, explains what was going through that former debtor's mind the minute he walked out of his king's presence. What was he thinking, this man who'd just been forgiven everything? My guess is that the second the height of his relief began to fade, his thoughts turned to other matters. The pain in his lower back or how he would spend his summer vacation or whether that little sticker in the upper corner of his windshield meant that he was 3,000 miles past due for an oil change or whether he was safe for a few more months or why it was going to be 20 degrees every day for another week. And there, he's the, here, hey, right there, there's that guy. He owes me money. In other words, I think that former debtor was much like you and much like me, easily distracted, the memory of grace erased by 10,000 daily interruptions, constantly forgetting just how much we have been forgiven, always wanting justice to trump mercy so long as we are not on the receiving end of justice. And so he grabs his debtor by the neck, demands repayment, full of self-righteous indignation, determined to get what he is owed. In my time working as a caretaker, caretaker for developmentally delayed adults, and I should interrupt myself here to say that when I had that job, I hated the fact that it paid $9 an hour, but in retrospect, it paid pure gold in the currency of sermon illustrations, and I should go back and (laughs) apologize to my boss who I complained to. But in those days, 
I had two men on my caseload whose names were Dave and Johnny. They were roommates, and when I met them, they'd lived together for more than 15 years. Picture the odd couple, except that Dave was Oscar and Johnny was also Oscar, and you begin to get a sense of the dynamic in their apartment. They got along beautifully. They loved the same television shows. They wore each other's clothes. They went bowling together every Thursday afternoon, all the while providing one another with a strong and enduring sense of emotional support that held them together. Unlike most of the other men that I tried to support in this job, these two thrived. They were joyful, despite living in an inhospitable culture that was often cruel to them because of their disabilities. These two needed each other, and they had each other. It was a joy to behold. I think it was one of the best friendships that I've ever witnessed. But they were human, and it wasn't perfect, and they fought. And what they fought about was work. Dave functioned highly enough to work outside. What he did was fold pizza boxes at Domino's. Meanwhile, Johnny spent his work days on a sort of low-key assembly line in a sheltered workshop with the other folks in our program. Dave's job was obviously better. In the world these two lived in, the cachet of a domino shirt was practically incalculable. He made friends, he ate free pizza, and best of all, each week at the end of the week he received a $20 tip out from the delivery drivers. And he lorded all of this over Johnny with a sort of subtle, constant kind of patronization. The money came in singles and $5 bills, and he would carefully, religiously set it on top of the dresser in his bedroom in a stack that would just grow higher and higher as the month went by. Meanwhile, Johnny had direct deposit, and I was the cosigner on his checking account. If he wanted to buy a six-pack of Mountain Dew, he had to ask me for permission. And then all of a sudden, Johnny always had a fresh pack of cigarettes. He always had a few dollars in his pocket. He always had a Mountain Dew in his hand. And you know where this is going. Midweek, when I dropped in on them, I found these two friends, these two men who needed each other so profoundly, both just heartbroken. Dave locked in his bedroom, Johnny on the couch with his head in his hands, and the story came out quickly. Dave had caught his roommate rifling the cash on top of his dresser, pocketing most of it. It had been going on for months. Weeks went by, and Dave refused to forgive his friend. Whenever I dropped in, it was all stony silence and Johnny's awkward overtures, confessing and asking for forgiveness and having it refused. Why, Dave said to me, why should I forgive him? I'm going to ignore him. And that's just what he did. And even though Dave's insistence on justice over mercy felt right, you could see this sadness in his eyes. The life had gone right out of their home. It used to be the highlight of my work week to drop in on these two, but I found myself putting it off. It was just too miserable to be in their apartment. Why should I forgive him? Dave put it so plainly, but the third or fourth time he asked it, He cornered me in his apartment. Why should I forgive him? And it wasn't a rhetorical question. More like, please tell me, Matt. Why should I forgive him? I want to. Tell me why I should. Or perhaps a plea is how I ask the question. How in the world... Can I ever find the grace and the strength and the love to forgive those people who have truly wounded me? How can you? On the surface, Jesus does not give an easy answer. He's just insistent. Forgive. And by the way, if you don't forgive, you will be tortured. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. So there they sit, Dave on one side of the living room, stone cold, Johnny on the other, Dave determined to remain stone cold, but obviously wanting nothing more than a return to the friendship that gave his life so much meaning. All of which is to illustrate the point I began this morning's sermon with. 
in the language of his own parable, Christ erases our debt and we are set free. He wipes it clean and we are set free. And Jesus wants to ask this question, what kind of hypocrite, what kind of ingrate would ever refuse to practice mercy once his own debts have been erased? The answer, I think, is a person who knows neither the measure of his debt nor the fact that it has been forgiven, or a person who has somehow managed to forget both the measure of her debt and the fact that it has been forgiven. How will we ever learn how to forgive? First, we will discover how much we need to be forgiven. And then we will realize that our debt has been destroyed. As a preacher, I'm loath to admit this, but the most essential part of this morning's liturgy and every Sunday morning's liturgy is not me standing here in this pulpit. It's the prayer of confession and the assurance of pardon and the relief we feel in that exchange. We could take it all away, leave that, and we'd still have the heart of the matter. First, we discover how much we need to be forgiven by God, and then we realize she has given us abundant grace, saturated us with it, given us more than we need, wiped our debt off the books, loves us unconditionally. Back to that apartment. Dave may not have been as guilty as Johnny, but he was hardly blame it, blameless. You could say he kind of instigated the thievery by carefully piling up that money and obsessing over it and lording it over his friend. But aside from that, he hurt people. I know he hurt people. He wounded his own family and he worried them. He acted selfishly. He offended God in the process. I know all of this not because he confessed any of it to me, but because he was a human being. It's what we all do. And I have no doubt that God loved him nonetheless. How could Dave ever hope to forgive his friend? By realizing that he himself had been forgiven. But how could he know? He didn't know the story. He didn't go to church. And no one in his life, as far as I knew, was going to start preaching him the gospel on the street corner or right there in his living room. I sure couldn't. He was asking me to. But at that point in my life, I stood a better chance of standing there and reciting the Gettysburg Address in French than I did speaking coherently about the love of Christ. I didn't have the language. I didn't know the story. I didn't know what was happening, why there was this distance between Dave and Johnny, between me and my own family, between the man I was becoming and the person I was born to be. I thought the story was over, just the tragedy of existence, the end, the book closed. I didn't realize that there was at least four-fifths of the narrative left. So the day that Dave asked me about forgiveness... And I stood there in his apartment, and I said nothing in response. I left totally stymied by the tragedy of existence, totally stuck in how much it can hurt to be alive, unaware that all I knew was the first act, the first chapter. Dave and Johnny left me yearning for the love of God, even though I didn't know it. It's Seminary Sunday today. Charles is going to talk to us about CTS in a few moments. The reason, part of the reason I want to tell this story is that it's one of the reasons I went to seminary. I didn't start going back to church the very next morning. But that conversation and my total and utter inability to be present to it, to speak the truth in it, changed my life. I wish that I could go back in time leap right back into that apartment and answer his question, why should you forgive? How should you forgive? Here's how. And you know that if I answer the only way that I know how, the only truthful way we can answer a question like that, the state of Minnesota probably would have fired me immediately. But here we are. I can say it here. How to forgive? Come to church. 
learn a story strong enough to order existence? What's the story that we intuit? An eye for an eye. What's the story our culture tells us? Me, mine, more, purchasing power. Those things can't teach us how to forgive. Come to church, learn a story strong enough to order existence. Pray the prayer of confession with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Receive the words of absolution as a stone broke debtor having all of her debt erased. And then... When you forget just how much you've been forgiven, and if you're like me, you're going to forget it at about 5.30 this afternoon. When that happens, come back to church. Come back on Easter Sunday when the brass pins your ears back and the smell of lilies lifts your senses up to heaven. Come back in the dead of winter when you have to kick the salt off your boots before walking in here to sing the day's first hymn. Come celebrate that God's love is yours, that Christ has erased every debt that once threatened to define you. And what Christianity promises over and over again is this. When this happens, when you receive the love of Christ, when you see God as the one who accepts you no matter what, you will realize that you have no choice but to turn and forgive the ones who wounded you. Forgive your family. Even if you had to leave your family in order to save yourself. Forgive God who wields grace as both a sword and a healing balm, tearing your heart in two, even as he sews it back together. Forgive yourself, not to excuse your own wrongdoing, but to let God be God, to let Christ's love change you. And if I don't, if I don't, if I steal my heart, deafen my ears to the story, refuse to be remolded, reformed, remade by grace, what happens then? Well, Jesus says, I will be tortured. Pay close attention, please. Jesus says, I will be tortured. Not in some cartoon hell with a pitchfork and a flame, not in some cartoon hell whose existence is a fiction, but right here in this life, my refusal to forgive its own just desert. Dave's refusal to forgive its own penalty as he stands there stone still, dead quiet in a home once filled with love, wishing desperately that existence were different, unaware that it already is. Amen.